Hello, alumni of Johns Hopkins University. I'm Jonathan Frakes, Commander Riker from Star Trek, The Next Generation, or should any of you happen to be watching Picard, Captain Riker at long last? At any rate, the Office of Alumni Relations has reached out to me to help kick off the virtual program on diplomacy, appropriate for Star Trek, inspired by Starfleet tactics and celebrating, of course, Star Trek Day. So, red alert, shields up. May you all live long and prosper and stay safe and have a wonderful anniversary. That is for the alumni, from the Office of the Alumni, and from me. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Darcy Drow. I'm a political scientist who studies uh, foreign relations, comparative politics, and on the side, I dabble in my interest in science fiction. In particular, I love Star Trek. I love all of the series. And so what I've been asked to talk to you about today is how can we understand diplomacy through the lens of Star Trek, through the worlds of Star Trek, through the characters of Star Trek, and most importantly, in their interactions with each other across the galaxy. So before I get in the content of this lecture, I'm gonna give you a warning. If you wanna keep listening, you should probably know something about the Star Trek world. So basic, you should know a little bit about the original series and Next Generation, the first two series. The next level, intermediate, if we want to get wonky here, information from Deep Space Nine, maybe Voyager is going to be helpful. So on the screen, you'll see the Cardassians, the Bajorans, in addition to the Klingons and the Federation. Finally, if we're going to get advanced and really wonky in our Q&A later, um, more knowledge of the world building across the quadrants, so bringing in uh, Weyun and the founders, the Jem'Hadar, then we can get really into the weeds on diplomacy across the galaxy. So let's look at our first clip here. In this episode from the Next Generation series uh, in, in, in season five, we're going to see Captain Jean-Luc Picard negotiate for a cloaked vessel from the Klingons. Captain, we are being hailed by the Klingon homeworld. Garan or Katow? Neither, sir. It is the junior adjutant to the diplomatic delegation. Junior adjutant. Name. Bychik, sir. On screen. Greetings, Captain. I regret to inform you that Garan and the High Council are quite busy and won't be able to speak with you today. Is Garan aware that we have been transmitting messages for the past three days? Captain. Goran wishes it were possible to talk with everyone who wants an audience, but he is one man. The demands on his time are formidable. If you would like me to take him a message. A message? Very well. Tell Gauron, leader of the High Council of the Klingon Empire, that his arbiter of succession, Jean-Luc Picard, needs a favor. A favor? I require a cloaked vessel. A cloaked vessel? This is no small favor, Captain. It is for a mission that could have repercussions throughout the Quadrant. How would it benefit the Klingon Empire? I'm sure Garon will ask. The only benefit to the Klingon Empire would be our gratitude. That is what you want me to tell him? Yes. And... Please add that if he is unable to provide us with a ship, then I am sure there are others in the Klingon Empire who would be willing to help me. And then, they would have our gratitude. I see. Also, please tell Gauron that I am immensely gratified that he is prospering so well. A tribute to his skilled leadership. So what I think is interesting about this clip is it shows us two things. First, 
It shows how one leader might use a delegate to kind of soften the negotiation process. The delegate can't give a final answer. He has to go communicate back to his, his leader. And so what that does is gives a little wiggle room on both sides. They can't back themselves into a corner. The second thing that I think is interesting and is kind of important if you look at the broader relationship between the Klingons and clan leader Gowron in particular is that uh, Jean-Luc Picard had promised to back him for leadership of the Klingon Empire. And this is a sort of way to ask for a favor in that tit for tat. But what exactly do we mean when we talk about diplomacy? So here's a basic definition of diplomacy. It's the process between two actors who officially represent their country in order to pursue their country's, but not necessarily personal, objectives in a peaceful manner through both public and private dialogue. So you can see here, there's several examples of what diplomacy might look like. It could be like a state dinner between uh, Macron and uh, President Biden. It could be a meeting of three countries with somewhat uh, tenuous relations like South Korea, Japan, and China. Or it could be negotiating big things, like at the Potsdam Conference, where the Allied powers negotiated how to divvy up uh, the, 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 after the results of World War II. So in this sense, diplomacy is a subset of foreign policy, which is a, comp a country's strategy for dealing with other countries. So other things that besides diplomacy, it could be war, it could be trade, it could be military alliances, and it can include foreign or humanitarian assistance or things like energy and climate policy, like we see in this last image with the COP28 um, about uh, environmental issues and climate change last year. So I like this quote when we think about diplomacy, which was from a recent episode of one of the new series, Strange New Worlds. In it, um, one of the characters said, we don't need to be friends, just allies. So really it's about the interests that bring countries or civilizations together. It's not necessarily about ideology or cultures that, um, that bring them together. It can be about broader strategic, economic, or political goals. So after this lecture, you'll be able to understand some basic concepts in international relations and the practice of diplomacy, analyze interests and goals of diplomacy, and then maybe apply the tools of diplomacy in your everyday life. Why should we look at Star Trek even if we're thinking about international relations, right? It's set in the future, these are fictional, uh, fish, fictional civilizations, but actually I think that's the strength. It removes stereotypes and preconceptions about history, contemporary contexts, even very famous leaders that we think about uh, in certain positive or negative lights. Moreover, because it's been uh, such a long, rich canon, we have a galactic relationships with fully realized civilizations and complex characters. Third, I think these civilizations have a lot of mutual interests and competing interests, which is exactly how the real world works. Nothing is simple. We live in a vast anarchic world, and this is a vast anarchic galaxy. Then it also is interesting because it imagines a future full of not only technological advancement, but different racial, gender, economic, and political configurations. Things that are increasingly important in our world that's at this critical juncture of change and technology and social issues these days. It's about the post-scarcity economy, so class takes the back seat. Instead, it's about reputation and expertise. And then finally, we have this united Earth, this united federation of planets. So the nation state, as we currently understand it, no longer exists. Instead, the scale is so much bigger. So these imaginaries are really the product of their times, as we see the evolution of the world through the many series that are now out there. So definitely, the original series has strong uh, metaphor for the Cold War. The Klingons as the Soviets, the Federation as the United States. But then when we get into the next generation, we see this post-Cold War US-led optimism where the Federation is really doing good for the universe, like the United States purported itself to be. Then finally, when we get to Deep Space Nine and Enterprise and further on, we're questioning what the, what the Federation and the United States as its analog are doing. So post 9-11 concerns with non-state actors, 
terrorism and the U.S. in decline relative to the world. We are questioning the limits on technology-human relations in Voyager and Next Generation. And then in Picard, in Discovery, we find fears of corruption and corrosion from within institutions rather than accepting these institutions as solid holes, as good institutions. Some of the most important concepts in international relations is about power and relationships, particularly about trust. How do power and trust affect diplomacy? In diplomacy, power and trust shape relationships and it shapes behavior of individuals and their interactions with each other. The next clip we're gonna look at comes from the original series. In this clip, Klingon Core interrogates Kirk. And you'll see some of the rhetorical devices that he uses in an attempt to build trust, to build rapport with his adversary. You'll have a drink with me, Captain. Oh, thank you. I assure you it isn't drugged. With our mind scanner, we have no need for such crude methods. What do you want from me? Oh, a very great deal. But first I want to talk. Just talk. Do you think I'm going to sit here and just talk with the enemy? You'll talk either here, now, voluntarily, or under our mind scanner. The fact is, Captain, I have a great admiration for your Starfleet. A remarkable instrument. And I must confess to a certain admiration for you. I know, of course, that it was you who destroyed our supplies last night. Something was destroyed? Nothing inconsequential, I hope. <laughs> Hardly. They were quite important to us, but they can be replaced. You of the Federation, you are much like us. We're nothing like you. We're a democratic body. Come now, Captain, I'm not referring to minor ideological differences. I mean that we are similar as a species. Here we are on a planet of sheep. Two tigers. Predators, hunters, killers. And it is precisely that which makes us great. And there is a universe to be taken. It's a very large universe, Commander, full of people who don't like the Klingons. Excellent. Then it shall be a matter of testing each other's wills and power. Survival must be earned, Captain. Tell me about the dispersal of your star fleet. Go climb a tree. Hmm. I can get what I want through our mind scanner, but there would be very little of your mind left, Captain. I have no desire to see you become a vegetable. This friend of yours, the Vulcan, he seems to have the ability to block our scanner. I think perhaps I will find out why. I will have him dissected. Your friend killed. You, a mental vegetable. Not a pleasant prospect, Captain. But it lies ahead for you unless you tell me everything I want to know. Twelve hours, Captain. It will take a lot longer than that, Commander. Longer than that, I will not wait. I respect you, Captain, but this is war. A game we Klingons play to win. Take him to the cell with his friend. What's interesting here is how Kor, the adversary of Kirk, who has so many moral and ideological differences, actually tries to make this ideological bridge based on his perception of the galactic relationship. He says that the species, the Klingons and the humans, are actually uh, more alike in the sense that they have great powers. This is certainly an analogy to the Cold War context, but it's also interesting from a diplomatic point of view because it's a rhetorical device in order to build trust, the idea that they're more similar than different. There are two types of power when we talk about foreign policy, international relations. 
First, and this is perhaps the most obvious, is the hard power. And we can think of this as coercive. It's how you make somebody do what you want them to do. So this is military capability. Ships, guns, nukes. It's why the enterprise is so much bigger than some of the other less developed civilizations that the Federation comes in contact with. Hard power can also be wealth, resources, economic uh, capacity. And then finally, it's geography, or this is why we talk about geopolitics. Where you stand in the world, where you're placed in the world, might give you certain advantages or make you the target of other countries or other empires. On the other hand, we have soft power, and we can see this as attractive. It's other people want to do what you want them to do. So the most paradigmatic example of this is Hollywood, right? We have these cultural products around the world. Everybody knows the Marvel Universe because how Hollywood is just pervasive across the world. This is cultural products. This is also communications networks. Uh, now in the advent of internet, in the internet in our digital age, these communication networks are becoming stronger and thicker. So we have ties across the world, across national boundaries that didn't exist in the past. And finally, we have people to people exchanges. So it's not just them talking across di differences, but also working together, studying together, living together. And in the Star Trek universe, since we can traverse the galaxy, these people to people connections become even more close. So given all the, di the diversity of power that you can have, this means that there's different variables that can influence how somebody handles diplomacy. In this clip, we're going to see Captain Sisko negotiate with the Maquis, which is a rebel group that's plagued him for years. And what's particularly remarkable about this clip is that it brings out the way that personal histories can affect how you're conducting negotiations with an adversary. In this case, the Maquis leader with whom he's negotiating was a former member of his staff who had been undercover this whole time. So you'll really see how much Cisco feels burned by his betrayal. Set torpedo targets to 50 kilometers above ground level. Lock. Ready, Captain. Time? One minute left. And still no transport ship activity or any other sign they're beginning to evacuate. Commander Worf, prepare to fire torpedoes on my mark. Detach safeties on torpedoes one and two. Detach. Incoming transmission at Zeddington. What are you really up to, Javert? You expect me to believe that a decorated Starfleet officer, the pride of the service, is going to poison an entire planet? That's exactly what I'm going to do. You're bluffing. Am I? Commander, launch torpedoes. Commander, I said launch torpedoes. Aye, sir. Trilithium resin is dissipating throughout the biosphere. The Maquis are scrambling their transport ships. They're starting to evacuate. Do you realize what you've done? I've only just begun. I'm going to eliminate every Maquis colony in the DMZ. You're talking about turning hundreds of thousands of people into homeless refugees. That's right. When you attacked the Malinche, you proved one thing. That the Maquis have become an intolerable threat to the security of the Federation, and I am going to eliminate that threat. But think about those people you saw in the caves. Huddled and starving, they didn't attack the Malinche. You should have thought about that before you attacked a Federation starship. Helm, lay in a course for Traken 2, Warp 6. Commander, prepare two more torpedoes. Engine break. Set course, course zero, 050, five, Unless safety is on torpedoes nine. 3 and 4. Can't you see what's happening to you? You're going against everything you claim to believe in. And for what? To satisfy a personal vendetta? You betrayed your uniform! And you're betraying yours, right now! The sad part is you don't even realize it. I feel sorry for you, Captain. This obsession with me, look what it's cost you. 
Major, shut that thing off. Commander Worf, prepare to launch torpedoes. Wait! If you call off your attack, I'll turn over all our biogenic weapons. Not enough! <sighs> all right, Javert. I'll give you what you want. Me. The second thing that I'm going to talk about in this lecture is how does culture affect diplomacy? Culture is a really big concept. What do we mean when we say culture? Well, we can mean patterns of learned and shared behavior. It's bigger belief systems, values, ethics. Where does one culture begin and one end? Well, we can say it's shared within social groups, age groups. In the era of globalization, some of these borders are becoming increasingly blurred. It can also include symbols, ways of communicating. Do you prefer text or giving somebody a phone call? It can even include logic processes. How do you reach a conclusion? Different people have different steps of how they get somewhere. One way to think about culture is actually thinking about an iceberg. There's a lot more under the surface than what you see. So at the top of the iceberg, what we see above the waterline are explicit cultural aspects, visible, tang tangible characteristics, manners. It's why when I go to Asia, I know which countries to bow and where to bow more deeply instead of giving a handshake. Or when I go see family in Latin America, I know to give them a kiss on the cheek. At the waterline, it's unexpected differences. So to use my example from earlier, it's uh, how many kisses on the cheek. When I see certain Europeans, it's two, or it's three. Um, you learn those things in processes of interaction. And this is where you see divergences between official culture and reality. Maybe one person prefers you shake their hand than bow. Then finally, it's things below the waterline, the deepest parts of the iceberg. So it's deep habits, assumptions that we make, understandings and values that we might not even know we have, much less another person. So if we apply this to the Star Trek world, we can think of explicit cultural aspects like the Federation values communication, the Klingons value honor, the uh, Vulcans value logic, right? These are core parts of their, their cultures, their civilizations. But then while we watch the episodes, we see how some of the characters diverge from it, right? Maybe Spock, because he's part human, has a bit of a temper sometimes, which betrays his human side. So these are the kinds of things we see through the series. One thing that's really important to keep in mind and that builds on this iceberg uh, metaphor is that culture doesn't determine behavior, personality, emotions. That would be what we call cultural determinism. But these elements, because the social nature of human beings, definitely shape how we act, how we feel, how we think. A core point of how Star Trek imagines its civilizations is cultural relativism. The characters in it can either be a little bit determinist or they can be more relativist. They understand and judge a, a, another person within their own culture, rather than projecting their own values on the other culture. And from a diplomatic standpoint, it can help you understand the other person's point of view. But this doesn't necessarily mean you accept those conclusions, those logics, those behavior. So this contrasts to cultural determinism. It also contrasts to cultural absolutism, which means that we can't make a value judgment about everything. It still allows us some wiggle room to have our own sets of beliefs while tolerating others. And this might be best summarized by the Vulcan ideology of infinite, uh, infinite diversity in infinite combinations, IDIC, which is, I think, a really interesting motto for us to think about, especially in today's climate. So when I tell people that I'm teaching a course about diplomacy in Star Trek, one of the first episodes they ask me if I'm teaching is the episode Darmok in the Next Generation series. This is just such a fun and interesting and challenging exchange 
where words don't really mean what they mean. So let's take a look at the clip. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Our situation was similar to theirs. I understand that. But I need to know more. You must tell me more about Darmok and Jalad. Tell me. You used the words Temba, his arms wide, when you gave me the knife and the fire. Could that mean give? Temba, his arms wide. Darmok. Give me more about Darmok. Darmok on the ocean. Darmok. Darmok. The ocean. Darmok on the ocean. A metaphor for being alone, isolated. Darmok on the ocean. <laughs> As his children, their faces wet. Uh, uh, uh. Temba, his arms open. Give me more about Darmok on the ocean. Tanagra on the ocean. Darmok at Tanagra. At Tanagra. Country? Nagra on the ocean, an island. Temba, his arms wide. Jalad on the ocean. Jalad at Tanagra. Jalad at Tanagra. He went to the same island as Darmok. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. The beast at Tanagra. Beast. There was a, a creature at Tanagra. Darmok and Jalad, the beast of Tanagra. They arrived separately. They, they struggled together against a common foe, the beast at Tanagra. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Darmok. Angelad on the ocean. They left together. Darmok and Jalad on the ocean. The ocean. Hail the Tamarian vessel. Aye, Captain. Cinder! His face black, his eyes red. Tamak! The river Tamak! In winter! Dermak and Jalad at Tanagra. Dermak and Jalad on the ocean. So Kath, his eyes open. The beast of Tanagra. Uzani, his army. Shaka, when the walls fell.
As you see, Picard was pretty frustrated. It took him a while to understand that Dathon wasn't trying to attack him, didn't have aggressive intentions, but was actually trying to build rapport and understanding despite their obvious communication differences that couldn't be overcome by the universal translator. We might call this mean language. We know memes today. It's, it's the use of cultural symbols, images, videos that we exchange online. But the Temerians also have a mean language. They're not using you know, a clips from contemporary popular culture. They're using it from their own mythology to express how a different situation, a mythological situation, can be used to build rapport through practice, through exchange of ideas. And so it's understanding this metaphors as Picard slowly comes to do, he's able to build more peaceful relations. In this lecture, we looked at how power and trust, relationships, culture, can tell us more about diplomacy than just about the Star Trek world. It tells us more about the real world too. Politics, as political science and international relations define it, is the study of power and relationships. Remember that diplomacy is the process by which you achieve your country's goals within these relationships, given certain power capabilities, in order to mitigate conflicts. Star Trek, as people that are watching this uh, video probably know, is a complex world. And even though it's fil filled with fictional relationships and broad political structures that look a little bit different from our own, they're tied to real world events and famous people. And so to analyze these relationships and power in alternate worlds, and we could say this about other science fiction, we learn how to analyze diplomacy and politics in our world too. To wrap up, there's no better way to end except live long and prosper.